Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Connie B. Dowell. Yes, Connie B. Dowell. Cozy Mm -hmm. and historical mystery writer. And we talk about, you know, writing, getting into writing, and about like being yourself and being authentic. Mm, And and newsletters. Newsletter, newsletter, newsletter. Yeah. 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 Uh, also about writing with children, like tips yes. on how to get stuff done when your kid's at home, because we know that the, you know, COVID-19 just, it's just rolling on. And mm-hmm. even though the vaccine is out, lots of people are still are back in lockdown again. Mm-hmm. So hopefully this will be helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause she's got some really good advice and she has little kids and she was super productive this past year. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good interview. It's a yeah. good interview. Uh, so what's been going on with you? Well, I have a wish I'd known then for, <laughs> to share <laughs> to hopefully <laughs> prevent people from being in this situation. So I did not realize that when I set up my website and all that stuff back in, like, I had, I, I did one myself when I, mm-hmm. my first book came out. And then later on in like 2012, I had somebody set one up for me, kind of gave me the nicer 2.0 version. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when I did that, the person was like, Hey, yeah, you can just use, I have Bluehost. You can just use Bluehost email. And so I set up my email through that and it turns out that that's doesn't work well in 2020. So maybe that was fine in 2012, but now in 2020, you apparently it's much better to have your email, not on a shared server, which is what mine is. So like everybody who's running their email through Bluehost is also on the same server I'm on. So like if somebody else sends spam, then they can also mark my email as spam. And oh, you have wow. To, yeah, so that, and I've had some trouble with getting my emails delivered. And of oh. course I have, you know, like all these folders and all this stuff and it's all, you know, it goes back years and years. And so mm-hmm. I am going to have to switch it to a different provider to a um, special email hosting provider, which I think it'll all be fine. And there they have companies that will integrate it for you, that mm-hmm. will do the, the move, the migration mm-hmm. for you. Yeah. So, but if you set it up right the first place, you don't have to do that. So, right. so that's my wish I had known. I wish I had known to set it up is with an email host first. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, A so I've been working on that and yeah, yeah and doing some writing mm-hmm. and um, yeah, that's about the whole week. So yeah. far. what about you? Oh, well, I finished my newsletter story. Um, well, I had finished it, but I finished editing it. It went it went to my editor um, on Wednesday, and which was two days before I thought I would get it done. So that oh, rarely good. happens. Um, so I'm going to put two chapters in my newsletter today. And then uh, hopefully by February, the first of February, I can put the whole thing up on my newsletter. I mean, on my website um, as a free story. And I'm, I'm going to have to do a little bit of revisions in that. Um, I wrote this book a chapter at a time and put it out. I didn't mm-hmm. really pre-write. So I know there are a couple of things that are a little bit out of order that I'll have to fix, but I don't think it'll be too much. And she was editing as we were going. So, you know, it's not going to be horrible. Um, but I've, I've decided, I think I'm going to get a cover for it. Uh, Mm -hmm. just a pre-made cover. And then I'm going to just put it on my website as a free book to sign up for my newsletter. Um, Mm -hmm. And so what I'll do is I'll, I think I'll leave it up on my blog for a month Mm -hmm. so that my newsletter people can all read it. And then I'll offer it, you know, Mm -hmm. as a freebie and probably just continue to put it in my newsletter as a freebie. Um, But so they don't, they don't have to sign up for it, you know, sign Mm -hmm. up to my newsletter list Mm -hmm. because I'm with MailChimp and they won't, delete duplicate signups. So that sucks. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that, that was going on. And then also this week on the Selmore book show um, episode 352, mm-hmm. one of the tips is this is genius. I'm telling you, I can't believe I didn't think of this um, on Amazon, on your product page below your uh, 
price, there's there's a little box and then and it I think it's where you can share a copy, you know, you can buy a copy for somebody else. But then below that it says embed. And you can take that embedded link and put it on your website. And when you put it on your website, they if somebody clicks on it, it's just like they can open it up and read a sample of your book. And then if they want, they can then click on to Amazon to buy the book. That is awesome. I didn't Isn't know that, that amazing. Yeah, I know. So episode 352, it's in the tips. And uh, I talked to Claire yesterday about it because uh, she had done it and she said it was it looked great, you know, and everything. Mm -hmm. And I had already, um, my assistant's already going to go in and put my audio links because I don't have my audio links um, on my website. Mm -hmm. So she was already going to do that. So we're going to do this as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you're interested in that, you can listen to that episode and um, yeah, and we'll put that in the show notes so you can find it easily. Yeah. But that's really amazing. I mean, I just, I've seen that before, but I didn't really know what it was for, but that's, yeah. that's and one it's of such a simple little thing, but I think yeah. people would use that, mm-hmm. you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Cause it's, it gives them a chance to read kind of a sample. It, yeah. Give a little yeah. And then, it, yeah. you know, I mean, if your sample's good, then it just increases the chance that they buy through. So, yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. Sounds, sounds great. About it all around here. Just, you know, doing normal stuff. Um, yeah. So this week I had my face swole, <laughs> swole up. I mean, I you had an allergic little, reaction. I had an allergic reaction, but I was trying, I just wanted to be pretty. And <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Botox or anything like that, but I just had a little facial thing done. And whatever, whatever, my eyes were slits. They're still swollen. It's just been a little bit of a nightmare um, around here. I mean, I just look like somebody stuck a hose in my mouth and blew me up. But, um, but you're it getting is getting better. better. You're it getting is better. Getting better. <laughs> you're recovering. She's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's just terrible. So oh, anyway, I guess word yeah. to the wise. Yeah, that's funny. We, Yeah, it's been quite a... I think this week with the news in the United States Mm -hmm. and just different things going on, it's been a little hard to concentrate, but I have got some words down and I'm considering that a win. Yes. um, Yes. Yeah. Very good. Things are going well. And um, right. So we hope this interview is helpful and um, we'll get to it and let Connie talk to us about all her tips for, you know, writing with kids and stuff like that. That's right. All right. Today we have Connie B. Dow with us. Hi, Connie. How are you? It's been great. How are y'all doing? We're great. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, me So too. here's Connie's bio. Connie B. Dow writes modern and historical cozy mystery as well as nonfiction for writers. She's been a bookmobile driver and a writing center coordinator. When not writing, Connie loves to paint, play the violin badly, and guzzle far too much coffee. She lives in Virginia with her husband and two wiggly kids. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> That's so great. I'm so would. jealous you play the violin. I, I was just thinking this morning, I wish I had learned to play something. It would be nice to <laughs> yeah, have that little time. diversion. <laughs> I know. I know. And I was not a very patient kid. So <laughs> tell us how you got into writing. Um, well, I, uh, I, I've always written. Um, according to my mother, I, as soon as I could hold a pen, I was writing. But I... As I as I grew up and you start to learn the like the world thinks that writers can't be a career. I'm not really I, I that must have come from an outside source because I actually came from a really supportive creative family, mm-hmm. but I tried so hard not to be a writer. Mm-hmm. Um, at first I thought I was going to be an English professor and then I got, you know, and I did love learning and I loved um the medieval studies program I was part of and I but I didn't know I wanted to do that for the rest of my life so I went to law school because that's what you do when you don't know what else to do (laughs) Uh, yeah that's what I do yeah (laughs) yeah well if you don't know what else to do and you're you're good with words you might decide to go to law school um and drop out after a year because that was not the right choice either Mm -hmm. um and so I then studied to be a librarian, and that's what, what I was doing while I was a bookmobile driver. Um, 
and graduated in 2010 when nobody wanted to hire anyone for a public service job. Right. Um, and I ended up as a writing tutor at a university campus and I loved it again, like the, the career didn't go anywhere, but I loved writing and I loved teaching writing and it, that opened the door to a lot of stuff I did later. Oh, that's great. So, that's interesting. so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when did you start writing fiction? Um, so I wrote fiction pretty much always, but I didn't, um, I, I really hesitated on jumping in the indie publishing bandwagon until I was doing writing center work. And I was um, doing some freelance editing because I, I had met another freelance editor doing that. And I'm like, oh, helping people do this. I could do this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very good. That is terrific. Mm-hmm. That is terrific. And it's fr- so interesting how our paths kind of wind and then we, all of us kind yeah. of end up as a writer through different ways, but um, I think it's very cool that you were mm-hmm. bookmobile driver and I love worked. that. Yeah, yeah, they're very cool. And I probably have that on a t-shirt. <laughs> bookmobile driver. <laughs> so, what is your definition of success? Um, to me, success would be um, doing something that you love in a sustainable way, um, and for everybody that's going to be a different level of time commitment and a different level of income, but something that you can keep going comfortably at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so important because Mm -hmm. right now there's a lot of emphasis on writing books fast and writing, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of books. And for most people, that's not sustainable. Some people are built to work that way, but not all of us. (laughs) I know I'm not. No. No, I'm not. So how many books a year do you generally put out? Um, it's uh, it's really varied a lot. Last year was, weirdly, even though it was 2020, I was mm-hmm. stubborn and it was my most productive year. And that was, if I count the planner, that was five books. Um, mm-hmm. That's a lot. Wow, that's so. fantastic. Yeah. I think, that's, you know, it just sort of seems like 2020 people either just – couldn't get out of bed. I'm raising my hand. Or they were just super productive. Like it it really I don't know that there was much of a middle ground for a lot of people. I think they either just dug in and thought, well, I'm gonna take advantage of this, or, you know, in my case, not be able to get out of bed. So yeah. Yeah, I I feel that like for me it was not being able to get out of the house was mm-hmm. like I am full of so much energy. It has to go somewhere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So you just channeled it into mm-hmm. your work. Well, that's good. That's so great. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you wish you had known about writing and craft when you started? Um, so I think I, I wish that I would have known, and this is particular maybe to cozy mysteries or to some, some other genres as well, mm-hmm. that more of my readers than I anticipated are skimmers mm. and I ended up getting, you know, some like feedback or negative reviews. Like, the, she never explained this. This doesn't make sense. And I'm going, what do you mean on page 82? I have this. <laughs> and to me, it's clear as day because mm-hmm. um, I've always, I've always read so meticulously, which is um, probably why I'm an editor because you train to read so meticulously. But if you're a skimmer, mm-hmm. you need those details repeated. Right. Right. So you just had something like this happen, didn't you? Yes. I feel like cozy mystery readers or mystery readers in general, they're either they're reading, you know, for the plot and the story and they're so into all the details or they're just kind of along for the ride and they're more into the Uh characters and the, the world and they're not so much interested in the mystery. So I think it kind of depends on which type of reader you've got, you know, and you know, you can, everybody can have like a mix, but yeah, I, yeah, I totally get that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes I have people that are like, but what happened to this person? I'm like, well, that was explained in chapter 12. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, once I didn't really belabor the point. Yeah, but that's a very good, because um, I think romance readers are the same way. I think there there are a lot of skimmers in romance uh, too. So that's uh, really something interesting to think about. Yeah. Like, so think. have you tailored your writing? You just... Um, emphasize things a little bit more? How do you handle that? Yeah, so I've been more careful um, kind of as 
as I go on to, to go back and in my revision process, go, okay, where can I reemphasize this point to make sure that really these really important but small details get repeated, um, I'll have the characters ruminate on them if I need to, to, to get that in at least one or two more times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, what about um, marketing? What do you wish you had known about, about marketing? Oh, so much. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> says that. Everybody's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I, when I first published, and part of this is because I first did it um, in, in 20, um, so 2014, mm-hmm. and I, I'm sure there were more resources out there at the time that I realized, but everything that I was reading was make sure you market. Don't forget marketing. Marketing's important. And that was it. It was like, be sure to market. And I'm like, okay, I will. How? <laughs> yeah. no, no details, huh? <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what did you do? Did you um, like, did you figure it out for yourself and just try different things? What, did, how did you handle it? Yeah. Well, I floundered for a long time as you would when you start and you go, okay, I do this thing. How? And like everyone, the only thing that people, people were talking about things that were that nowadays seem kind of laughably ineffective to me, um, at least for my business, it might work for other people, but like, blog I'm like great for nonfiction um Mm -hmm. not so great for fiction at least in my experience um Mm -hmm. so they're like blogging posting all the time on social media well you have to have a following first Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 so what did what ended up working for you as far as marketing yeah so what ended up changing the game for me um, was as I discovered more resources and got more information about how to actually market your books, um, like the number one game changer is building an email list. Email list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Number one. Mm-hmm. How'd you go about doing that? Did you do um, bonus content or did you um, offer free books or? Yeah. So again, I floundered for the first part. I was just like, sign up for my list. It's great. And of course, yeah. I signed up. Um, <laughs> but they signed up when I start when I um, wrote a tie-in short story, and mm-hmm. I put a link in the back of the book. Um, and that's that's how I started getting interested. Crazy how that works, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the number one thing people always say: newsletter and mm-hmm. you know, getting people on it is key. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. very common very common thing that a lot of us don't understand when, cause I think we've been so, inf- so into the writing that when we get done, we're like, Oh, now we have to market. Okay. How are we going to do this? <laughs> it's a new thing to figure out. Well, and I think we bring our, our own biases and assumptions into this and say, well, I don't want to be on more email lists. So I don't want to do that to people. But if somebody agrees to sign up for your newsletter list, they're agreeing to hear from you. So let them hear from you and give them the opportunity to do that. But um, yeah, they really, um, I think they just, people don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Yeah. Um, so one thing I assumed was because my first self-published book was nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Um, it was about uh it was a, a primer on college level writing and how to get through your college course. I called it, you can love writing how to get through your college papers and like it. Um, <laughs> and I thought that that was going to be a bigger part of my career mm-hmm. because that's what I thought. My, I thought my day job was going to like uh, launch me down the road into more day jobs. Right. It And when it kind of didn't, I ended up like closing that blog and, focusing more on my fiction and focusing mm-hmm. more on helping writers because that was the part of, of I was disappointed that mm-hmm. that writing center career just didn't seem to be happening but mm-hmm. but it did lead me to the passion for like helping other writers which yeah is still going and cool yeah so you, do you do I mean are you a an editor I mean people pay you to edit their books is that yeah, I'm an editor and a, and a coach. So And a coach, yeah. So that's great because, you know, you're still getting to use that information, just not in the way you thought you would. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Yeah. Well, we like to talk about, like, mistakes and lessons learned and things like that. So have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? 
Hmm. Mistake that turned out to be a good thing. I think, um, I think one, one thing I did that I, I was, I was afraid was going to be a mistake. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out good was when I launched my, my book mobile, um, series i i wrote it very you know i'd had people tell me forever because i'd been a bookmobile driver you should put that in the cozy mystery and i wrote it very much to market except for one thing um because it was partially inspired on that part of my life i didn't want to straight wash the character mm. so i i wrote a bi protagonist and mm. i put that out there and of course some of the very first emails i got from readers were you can imagine pretty nasty yeah. And when you get that, like, especially on the launch day, I'm going, oh, God, did I just sink my career and, like, sick a whole bunch of um, of bigots on me for nothing? Um, but it's actually turned out to be one of my better selling books. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, and people good. are looking for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's so, one, it was brave, I think, to do that because you don't know. Um, and Second of all, I mean, not everybody looks like us. I mean, you know, I mean, and I mean, I'm speaking from my own experience. I mean, everyone doesn't look like a middle class white woman from Texas. You know, I mean, that's just how it is. And so we need to, I think that's, it's a good practice to see where you can walk the line, but also expand, you know, the horizons and and who the people are and your characters um you know within the genre expectations so i think that's great good for you yeah yeah did she um i mean did you like how long did it take for people to kind of come around to that or was it sort of a few months of oh my gosh or just those first Um, few days it was less than i thought um i had like yeah, I had maybe like a 12 hour freak out. And, and then I <laughs> then I got emails from like the sweetest little old grandma who oh, was like, nice. I'm so glad that you feel like you can write someone like you. And they, it was just and so like the backlash was there. But mm-hmm. um, but especially as I, I've gotten I changed my stance on and I, I hate that I have to do this. I hate mm-hmm. that I have to label every single book don't as LGBT it, yeah. content because I don't mm-hmm. think. I don't think this should have a content warning, but I know if I don't, I will get emails. Yeah. Right. But then yeah, that lets readers know what yeah. it is. And then there, and I know that there are people who are looking for that. And like you That's said, it, it's like a smaller, probably not maybe necessarily a smaller, but it's like a different kind of niche than like a main, I don't know what you call like a contemporary cozy mm-hmm. with straight characters. So, but if people are looking for that, then that will help them find it too. You know, so that may not necessarily be a bad thing, but I can understand why you would be hesitant to yeah. label it. Yeah, it's definitely, a, that is a, a positive upside. Um, and it, it's, that's why I have just like mixed feelings about labeling. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Well, I have a book that um, it's not cheating. It's not a cheating book, but there are some people that might, it, it walks a fine line. And so I put it in the, you know, when I was writing the blurb, I made sure to put that plot point in the blur because I didn't want to get a bunch of bad reviews because they considered it a cheating book. And, um, you know, I've never, I've never had one review mention that it's cheating or whatever. So it sort of work. It works. I didn't, I really didn't want to have to do that. I didn't put a warning, but it's clear in the blurb that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that he's separated from his wife kind of thing. And, but it just, you know, I think when you do that, you sort of attract the right people and you, you know, repel the wrong people, which is what we want to do anyway. So that's good. That's good. Um, so what about the opposite? Is there something you thought this is a home run? I'm going to, this is going to change my career. And then it just didn't work. All right. We get to talk about the fart book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first. 
My husband will love this episode. He only really laughs out loud at fart jokes and people puking. So there you go. <laughs> well, so you have yeah. to tell us more. I have to tell you more than the fart book. Um, it started, I was, I was just writing a short story for um, an in-person critique group I was part of at the time. And I had, it started the story about a burglar who th- is surprised by um, her mark coming home and she hides in a closet and is given away by the beanie bean burrito that she <laughs> had for breakfast. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. awesome. so it was silly. It was fun. It was, it was a heist story with lots of fart jokes um, and a fun, diverse cast. And, and my critique group, we were like, well, you got to keep going with this. And so I thought, People are laughing out loud. They love the fart jokes. Um, turns out there is there really is a lot of people who don't like fart jokes. And even when you put fart all over the blurb, you're gonna get there's too many fart jokes in this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, and it also was a weird, not quite one genre or another. It's it's like there is a romance element, but it's not romance. Mm-hmm. It's it's a heist and it's funny, but it's not cozy mystery. So it just doesn't fit anywhere. Um, but it's fun and full of farts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've done that where you write something that's like kind of not quite cozy, not quite romance. It had some heist stuff in it. So no, I don't think it had any fart jokes, but you know, it's hard to find your, it's hard to find uh your target audience because they're kind of spread out so mm-hmm. yeah so anyway that's very funny though that's hilarious that was i needed that laugh this morning that's good <laughs> <laughs> well so switching tracks a little bit um how important do you think mindset is um, i think it is very important but i think it i think you can't really develop it in mm-hmm. isolation outside of like doing the work yeah mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, you just have to keep pressing on and that's when you develop your mindset. Yeah. So have you had any like big mindset mindset shifts that you've experienced as you've gone through your writing career? Um, I think just learning more of my own persistence um, is one of them and, um, and being more confident as as I like to say in my head, the CEO of my own publishing business. Um, and it takes time to get there, but, but yeah, the more you do the work and take it seriously, the more you see yourself as that CEO. Yeah. 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 I I think what you said is important too, like you can't, did you say you can't do it like alone? In isolation. Yeah. In isolation. Yeah. And I think that's what's made this year hard for some people is because we are isolated and you do sort of need people around you that are like-minded and Mm -hmm. can help feed that mindset, you know, that you're striving for. Um, so tell you yeah. you're not crazy. Go ahead and go right. for it or whatever you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 I, um, uh, I'm kind of in the middle of a mindset, mindset sh- shift. I gotta be careful. It's hard to um, say, isn't it? <laughs> wow. And, um, yeah, it's kind of weird. I mean, it's, it's like, completely different from some of the stuff I have been doing because if you've listened to the podcast, if any of you listen to podcasts, you know, I struggle with comparison and stuff like that. And I've really, I am moving my mind, my mindset away from that. And it panics me a little bit, but on the other hand, there's like this piece. It's really cool. I mean, it's, you know, and for me though, it's kind of the opposite. It's not being around all of those people or choosing Mm -hmm. not to be around uh, you know, in some environments because it's so, you know, I don't know, intense, I guess. Yeah. Is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. 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 That's great. Uh, so you have an, you have experienced writing with your children. In fact, when we uh, first start, before we started, you said, I hope you don't hear my children downstairs. Um, what are your tips for getting writing done when you have kids at home? And I know a lot of people are going to want to hear this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, um, yeah, there it's, it's the first step would be like, it's tough, but possible. Um, mm-hmm. They never want to lie to anyone is the hardest possible way to work. 
mm-hmm. but it but it is possible. The word possible is still there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, what I what I do, what I what I learned to do when I was kind of like coming back from a major creative slump where I hadn't written in a long time, um, mm-hmm. and was now getting back to it with lots of little, little tiny distractions, um, is one was was taking it really slow. Um, mm-hmm. Especially if you're not used to writing with your kids around, maybe you're aiming for just like ten minute, a ten minute sprint, and then later it once you feel comfortable with that, bump it up to fifteen, bump it up to twenty, mm-hmm. um, as well as like snatching the little bits of time when they aren't bothering you. Yeah, um, yeah. because <laughs> otherwise you can get interrupted like every fifteen seconds, and that's that's like the worst. <laughs> yeah. But. But yeah, but you also, if you and you really don't have any kid free time at all, kind of have to learn how to do that, even though it's painful. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can, you know, you might set your timer for 15 minutes of writing, but you're not actually writing for those 15 minutes. You're just practicing getting used to being distracted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And writing at the fringes of the day, you know, before anybody wakes up. After they go to bed mm-hmm. and stuff, that, yeah, that might be. Yeah. yeah, it's hard. It's it's hard to be. It's really hard being interrupted. Um, it, but you have to train yourself to go. Okay, I have this time. I've got fifteen minutes. I'm going to write for fifteen minutes. That, that that's a skill. I mean, that mm-hmm. really is something you have to practice. I think. Yeah, I wrote many, many words like when my kids were little, and it. I learned to write like when there was an episode of Barney was on because I knew I had like 20, 19 minutes or whatever, or I would write like in the car, waiting for them in the car line to pick up at school. And, you know, it was just, you know, wherever I could get, like you said, just a, this little you know window just mm-hmm. to take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and using nowadays we have so much technology that like you can write on so many different things and piece it all together in one word doc. Like you can right. write on your phone, you can dictate, you can um, you know, write on the laptop, you can write on a scrap of paper and type it up later, um, just like wherever you can on whatever you can. Right. Yeah. Do you use dictation yourself? Um, I used to use dictation a ton, um, but it is a double-edged sword because you have so much more cleanup. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Definitely I, find, I would. Yeah. Do you find it uh, – it takes less time just to type it instead of doing the dictation and then cleaning it up. Right now I do. Um, and I probably will waffle back and forth, mm-hmm. especially as my kids get older and I have, and I have like the quiet to actually train the dragon mm-hmm. because yeah. Yeah, if you don't have quiet, you're <laughs> never going to train it. <laughs> right. That That's true. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I saw that you have a planner for writers. So um, can you tell us um, how that came about? And then um, if you have any advice for somebody who'd like to create a planner, like for their um, audience. Yeah. Um, so it came about just because I, I like planning and, and planners and I, I, um, I'm kind of a, perhaps a little bit too obsessive about planning. Um, I like to like make um, planning sessions, not just at the beginning of the year, um, but also every quarter, every month and kind of revisit that. And, especially like when working with writers um, in terms of editing and coaching, it felt like a natural extension. I didn't okay. see the, I, I made the planner I wanted to see in the market. I actually have it like right over here. Yeah. So tell us um, the name of it. It's the messy. Uh, it's the messy, messy author, author planner yeah. <laughs> and nobody can see it because we are on audio, but um, yeah, but yeah. we'll link to it. Yeah. So it's messy author planner and there's a 2021 dated version and an undated version. Um, in case people want to like start in the middle of the year and be able to circle back and use the whole book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, um, so it kind of came out of your own need for it basically, or is it was more to help the people you're working with keep things straight or. Um, A little bit of both Um, a little bit of uh, my own needs and for people to keep things straight. And also um, because I, I guess I just, I saw a lot of planners with this very like clean Pinterest aesthetic that you were almost afraid to write in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you need to be as messy and scribbly with your planner. Yeah. Right, right, right. yeah. 
Well, that yeah. is awesome. So how long did that take you to, to, to figure out how to do that? I got the B on my bonnet, like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a planner in November of 2019. And there was definitely not enough time between November of 2019 <laughs> and 2020 to do that. So I just did it a little bit at a time over the course of 2020. Okay. Well, it turns well, out that that's if you had done one for 2020, wise too. Yeah. it would have um, been yeah. difficult to use anyway that year. Yeah. It would have been kindling. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's, well, that's good. That's awesome. And I've thought about that too, that it would be fun to do a planner. So, so yeah, I'm curious, did you just, is it, did you use like KDP print or? Yeah, I used KDP print. Um, the, since Ingram Spark has kind of changed their rules on what's printable, mm-hmm. like they're no longer printing line journals. A planner was just on the edge. So yeah. right now it's just with KDP print. Yeah. Um, yeah. Easier that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's easy. Um, uh, it's, uh, you will want to be careful if you're making a planner um, and you are like really detailed like I am. I was like right up against the page count for like what they could possibly print. So um, oh, yeah, yeah make, take note of those things. Um, and I do recommend making it over the course of, of a long period of time, if not a whole year. That way you use it at the same time and see that it works. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. That's what I was thinking that, you know, if you, if you take your time to do it, then you, it's sort of like writing a series, you get to the end, and you're like, Oh, I wish I'd have put that way back at the beginning, you know, and you have time to go back in and see things in that you think, over the course of the year really would help. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. So interesting. And that's not how my brain works. So I'm fascinated by stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, so you have a podcast as well called Book Echoes, correct? Yeah, and right. so we, we're curious because, you know, this is what we do. How do you balance uh, your podcast and your fiction writing, your podcasting and your fiction writing? Um, I really just see that as like the second half of, of what I do. Like I'm half a fiction writer and I half have this nonfiction, um, podcasting, editing Mm -hmm. focus. So, um, so it really just kind of got split down the middle. One thing I do to do a few things to kind of make, because podcasting, like it can, it can expand to fill all your time if you're not careful. (laughs) Y'all know that. This is true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm, I'm very careful about like, not I'm like, okay, just do the editing I have to do. I don't have to cut out every um and ah. Um, when I first started, I wanted it all to be perfect. Um, and done is better than perfect. Right. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, I also transitioned to wave. I, I, at first, I did just interviews. And um, I knew that I, because you know, I have smokers and I have the, had, I've, I've got more time now, but I had at the time a really limited schedule. Mm-hmm. So I did interviews every other week and solo episodes every other week. Mm-hmm. And that helped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That does help. Um, it's, I mean, we have somebody that edits ours because that was just like something we were, because there's two of us, we can split the cost. And, um, yeah. But yeah, that was one thing that I was like, I'm not taking that on. Yeah. Poor Sarah. I'm like, <laughs> you need a podcast wife like I have uh, in Sarah. But um, I outsource though too. <laughs> it still is a lot. I mean, you know, you, yeah. You have to plan it into your week. You have to plan it into your, you know, day. And if we try to do certain days, like Mondays and Fridays, but if you interview someone in another country, then you really kind of have to be flexible with them because they're, you know, they're on another schedule and stuff. And so you have to work that into your, to your plan as well. And so, um, but I love it. I don't know about you, but I just, I love it. I love talking to people. I love what I learn from people. And um, tell us what your podcast though is about. What do you, what's the premise of your podcast? Yeah. So it's, um, it's mostly general author interviews talking about anything from writing, publishing, marketing to, um, I, I don't like work-life balance, but that's what everybody says, even though it's never really balanced. <laughs> it's never yeah. balanced. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So have you found that, um, is, is your uh, podcast audience separate from your fiction audience or is there any crossover to your, I, cause see, I feel like our podcast is more geared towards writers and mm-hmm. nonfiction mm-hmm. and my fiction, you know, I don't think my w- readers would be interested in listening to this podcast unless they're maybe trying to become a writer. So have you right. found any crossover? 
Yeah, same here. No, not really any crossover at all. Yeah. So, so it's that's really a- just a project of love and as yeah. opposed to uh, anything to monetize at any point, and which is, I don't know. We'll edit that. Hang on a minute. It's a project of love, which is good because, you know, I mean, we're not trying to monetize necessarily anything, but yeah, um, it really so, is just Sarah and I just learned so much from podcasts. Mm-hmm. We, we, that's how we met each other through a podcast mm-hmm. uh, that went, that had a, like a, summit a conference or whatever mm-hmm. and uh so we just wanted to get back in that way yeah 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 so i think like if you're a writer a fiction writer and you're thinking about starting a podcast don't gear it towards writers if you're trying to reach readers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's yeah not that we were trying to do that we more were interested in learning ourselves so yeah mm-hmm. sounds like you were kind of the same mm-hmm. yeah yeah so it uh, i mean i'd already learned the hard way from like to put a blog and of course like every other writer um when trying to market their fiction i wrote about writing my fiction guess yeah. who follows that writer yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> Not so how long have you been doing your podcast um so I, I did kind of have like a start and stop period when the kids were a little really young but i i, I really got consistently going about two years ago oh that's great so, yeah, that's really great. Yeah, so everybody should check that out for sure. Yeah. And we'll have um, the link in the show notes. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success? Do you think? Mm. Um, I I I've been thinking about this question. I think uh, there's three <laughs> answers that Good. that are Good. really tied. The best three things that I've done. One I've already mentioned: the newsletter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Newsletters are key. Um, the other thing is. I married the right spouse. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the third thing is that he makes tacos. <laughs> so yes. if you have a supportive <laughs> spouse and you have tacos and you have a newsletter, you're well on your way. That's awesome. <laughs> it's great. so true. It's so true. Yeah. I, yeah. I feel, I know I have friends whose spouses aren't particularly um, supportive and they're, they're successful, but it's just, they just don't have that support. And I just feel so sad for them because it makes all it makes the difference it a in the harder. world. Yeah. I think. Yeah. It makes you it can do really it, hard, but it's yeah. harder, I think. So really I know hard. people will be curious about your newsletter. So how mm-hmm. often do you send your newsletter? That's always a question people yeah. debate, yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, for non for, for, for fiction, I only send um, every other week. And mm-hmm. that's been a frequency that I've found that I can keep up with and, Readers are, are happy with um, nonfiction. I, I send shorter newsletters every week. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. good. That is cool. And then for your your fiction, do you have certain topics that you cycle through, or is it all about your research, or what do you what do you dig into yeah. for that? Um, so that, that did take a while to get really comfortable, um, and that's if you're just starting out your newsletter, you're probably going like, "What do I write about?" Yeah, I have to come up with something new every two weeks. Uh, um, but after a while, it does, you start to get to know your readers and you know the topics they're interested in. Um, background research for your books is always a good topic um, because some of my books are historicals. I can talk about interesting historical stuff um, and photographs that I find. Um, but like just general interests of cozy mystery authors, like I'll, I'll share the, the latest recipe that I loved making, mm-hmm. garden stuff. Um yeah, that kind of things. Yeah, so you just tailor yeah. it to what your reader specifically would be interested in. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it does take a while to kind of figure out that blend of mm-hmm. what will work best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, very cool. Well, where can people find out more about you? Well, you can find me um, and my um, podcast and nonfiction side at bookechoes.com and my fiction side at connybdowell.com. All right. right. Very good. Well, we're so glad you were here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for chatting with me this morning. All right. (laughs) All right. Thanks for listening today. And you can find all the links at wish I'd known then podcast.com. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the wish I'd known then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.